across the country. Now, in the 11 and a half years since then, my life has been defined by the consequences of the actions of those awful men. There are no words I can use to explain to you the amount of fear and the amount of awful, terrible sadness experienced by the Muslim community in that time. But I can tell you that I've seen innocent people arrested for no reason other than their demographics. One of my father's friends, for example, was arrested because his wife enjoyed the view off of a bridge and decided to film it. And apparently that was indicative of impending terror. I can tell you that I've heard of friends, family, Muslims across the country harassed, abused, assaulted for no reason other than the color of their skin or a cloth they wore across their head. Most recently, the aggravated assault of a Bengali American man in New York City, but perhaps most brutally, the stabbing 33 times of a six months pregnant mother of two in Louisiana, a sister of one of my mother's friends. I've seen federal spies infiltrate mosques, creating an atmosphere of fear in a house of worship that was supposed to be a safe haven. To this day, I know people who are afraid to talk about politics and their house of worship for fear of spies being present or the mosque being bugged. I've been spat at while selling Girl Scout cookies, received threatening phone calls in the night at home, a scandalous glances and insults and stereotypes from classmates and teachers. Yes, even here at TJ. Avoided walking in public for fear of attack, spent nights terrified that my father would be arrested because he had the audacity to be Muslim and proud of it. And throughout all of this violence and bigotry and discrimination, I have heard over and over and over again how I am evil, how I am the enemy, how I am dangerous, how I cannot be American, how I should just go home. Although I really have no other home to go to, unless you count New Jersey, but I don't think that's what they meant. I have seen my father, an activist like him, vilified and discredited by the bigotry of a few that stifles the voices of millions. And this has left an indelible mark on who I am today. You see, in many ways, Muslim Americans in the post 9 11 era have been forced to live a political life, speaking up against injustice for their brethren overseas, straddling identities, and bearing the unfair burden of representing their faith to their countrymen. And in this burden arises a crisis of identity. I did not know how to reconcile my faith with my country that glorifies its detractors. How to be American and an America that clearly did not agree that I should be. This dissonance manifested itself in countless sleepless nights, frequent affirmations that I was white, really, because as an American, there's really no ethnicity that fits me either. And perhaps came to a peak when, in the fifth grade, I declared confidently that I was no longer an Arab, and that having purged the hyphenation, from my American, they could no longer hate me anymore. Obviously, it doesn't quite work that way, and identity is not that easy, because my inner conflict never really went away, and the struggle to reconcile what I had known with what I saw every day was still very much alive. So why am I telling you this? Why did I give you a few minutes synopsis of the struggles I've faced in the past 16 years? Because study after study after study after study show us that a solid identity, understanding who we are in the context of where we came from, is essential to drive, to ethics, to moral action throughout our lives. In 1992 and 1993, psychologist Ann Colby and Professor William Damon of Stanford University co-authored a study of 23 so-called moral exemplars focusing on the integration of their morality into their identity and how central this identity was to their actions. They found that the people whom we value as moral exemplars in our society are not the people who have the most just values or the most loud voices or the most strong opinions, but rather those whose identity and self sense of self are strongest and most integrated with their beliefs. This was further analyzed in various studies.
less individuals and religious groups, identity is even more essential. Not only is it beneficial to self-esteem and confidence, but it also allows people from these groups to build for themselves moral action that is relevant to them, thus empowering themselves and their communities. So now, let's go back to the 14-year-old girl whose identity was perhaps the biggest hurdle she had ever faced. It was actually not until the summer after my freshman year, as I spent the summer in Tunisia with my family who had fled the fighting the revolution in Libya, engaging with my heritage and understanding the struggles of those before me, a process of active, subtle, and 50 different kinds of important, that I understood what it was to be simultaneously Libyan and American. We were celebrating the victory of Tripoli, the streets reverberating with the ecstasy and wonder, and my uncle told me that this was the first time he had ever seen patriotism touch the hearts of Libyans. The first time he had ever felt such pride himself, and at that moment, I understood with tears in my eyes, are still in my eyes today, um, that while that victory was to them a singular one, to me it was dual. An Arab one and an American one. Because on that night, I was able to put to rest the crisis of identity that I had faced throughout my life. And to finally accept the hyphenation, whether Libyan or Arab or Muslim, to my American. And from here, I was able to not only identify the issues that I cared about and that were relevant to me, but to also launch myself into causes that address different aspects of who I am and who I understand myself to be. I've worked on political campaigns, as well as been involved in social justice rallies, campaigns, and advocacy programs that encompass anti-racism, feminism, and human rights. So not only did this practice of identity build my confidence and set self-esteem, but it also allowed me to develop the integration of my morality into my sense of self, furthering the sense and making it more concrete. So we can see that like all processes of change, identity is an active one. We must try to understand who we are and where we come from before we can even try to know where we're going. And as science has shown us, identity shapes the moral action that we take into whatever field we pursue. Because once I recognized and accepted the different aspects of where I came from and who I am, as an Arab, as a Libyan, as a woman, as a Muslim, as an American, this confluence was able to guide me into not only working toward what I cared about, but also understanding how and why. And so I will leave you with this. Identity, often eroded and destroyed by bigotry, and the steps that we take to understanding it are essential to moral action and to making the world a better place. Thank you.